Kaide Azam Memorial Lectures. We now bring you the fourth in this series of talks on the ideology of Pakistan by Mr. Justice Abu Saeed Chaudhry, Vice Chancellor, University of Dhaka. It will be followed by a question answer session. Ladies and gentlemen, when I accepted the gracious invitation of Radio Pakistan to be here tonight, I did so for it would give me an opportunity to offer my heart's tribute to the father of the nation. I hardly realized that a vice chancellor had no time to call his own. This accounts for my not coming with a written or a prepared speech. Kaide Azam was born, as you are aware, ladies and gentlemen, in 1876, during the reign of Queen Victoria. No one realized at that moment that this child, born in a business family of Karachi, would one day snatch away a territory from the great-grandson of Queen Victoria and found a, a state for a new nation which again will be created by him from a crowd in a subcontinent. Early years of Kaide Azam are known to all of you. He grew, as others do, playing with children, classmates. Then his ambition was to be a lawyer. And I recall with somewhat personal pride that he chose the profession of law. He went to England, was eventually called to the bar from the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn. As a student in Lincoln's Inn, he came in contact with that great personality of international repute who brought fame to India, Dadafai Nauraji, and took great part in his election. That was his first test in politics. After campaigning successfully for that great leader of Indian nationalism, he came to India, started the practice. As the early years of anyone joining the profession of law are always years of struggle and hard work, so it was also for a man like of whom was rarely seen in the profession of law. He got encouragement from an advocate general who was an Englishman and was allowed by him to read in his chamber and attend to his professional work. But that was not enough. As one biographer said, if the footpaths of Bombay could speak, they would have certainly recall the days of frustration, helplessness of a person 
who was later destined to found a state. In this state of his mind, he applied for the post of a presidency magistrate. This gave him an opportunity to settle in life. But a man of his unbounded passion and courage could not remain confined to an office like this. He soon resigned. Then he got better result in the profession of law and made his headway. And by his sheer industry, ability, determination, courage, he soon made a mark and went to the very top of the profession. After having established himself a great lawyer, he was taking interest in politics gradually. In the early years, he came in contact with Gandhi, Gokhal and others and was attracted to Home Rule League. But he found that if Muslims were to emerge from the state of inertia and isolation to which they were relegated, they should unite together. That is why the most glorious event of his life at that stage took place when he organized the Muslims of India to assemble at Lucknow in 1916, just when the Congress was also holding a session. And there, with the help of the leaders of the Congress and also with the united support of the representatives of the Muslim op opinion in the subcontinent, he could persuade the Hindu leaders to agree to reservation of seats for Muslims in Muslim minority provinces. That was considered to be a firm and glorious step. But unfortunately it was soon realized that the Hindu majority was not willing to concede any rightful claim of the Muslims of the subcontinent. Soon after this, Jinnah realized that Gandhi was not willing to give any further concession. But with the support of any Besant, Sarojini Naidu, and some other Congress leaders, he tried his level best to bring about settlements between the two communities of the subcontinent. And he declared again and again that the attainment of cherished object of freedom from the British rule lay in the unity of all communities and of all races. And at that stage, 
He was working with such firm determination and courage and will that he was acclaimed soon as ambassador of Hindu-Muslim unity. But Jinnah soon realized that he could not achieve what he wanted to do remaining within the fold of the Congress. He therefore left the Congress and for a time he did not take much part in politics. To my mind, the most glorious chapter of Kaidayasam began when he came back in 1934 with the determination that he must unite the Muslims of India and give them a sense of direction. They must know themselves. They must find out their lost soul. They must know who they were. They must not forget that glorious chapter of history that they ruled the subcontinent for 700 years. And his firm determination was to wipe out the tears, frustration, sorrow and grief of the Muslims after the Battle of Plassey. He, he came with the determination that this, this community should be rejuvenated and when the Government of India Act 1935 was passed, he found in it the scope for realization of his dreams. He at once started to organize the Muslims of India and with the help of the Muslim leaders all over the subcontinent, he tried to rouse enthusiasm which acquired proportions unparalleled in the history of the subcontinent or probably in the history of any other country. Here in undivided Bengal, he was ably supported by a person of unbounded enthusiasm and courage and determination Hussain Shaheed Suhravardi, who organized what was then called United Muslim Party. And this United Muslim Party was the basis for the reorganization of the All India Muslim League, which later contested the election. To cut a long story short, it was soon realized that the demand of the Muslims was taking a definite shape and there must be a homeland of the Muslims. In, in 1940 at Lahore, Fazlul Haq moved the resolution which was accepted by the Muslims of the subcontinent. From that day, I should say, a new nation was born and recognized. And Mr. Jinnah's two-nation theory was accepted by 
all well-meaning person. The journey was still very arduous and hard. The Hindus thought it was a mere camouflage to get some more concessions. Neither Mr. Jinnah nor his followers believed in this demand. That was one big mistake they made. And they did not yet see reason and justice. They were not prepared to accept what was truth and what was reasonable concessions to the Muslims. They still kept on bargaining, so much so that they probably thought they could have a constitution without the concurrence of the Muslims of India. It is not possible to give a detailed account. You know how Lord Wavell almost by passing the Muslim League formed a cabinet going back to his solemn word. On that day, I was in London. I met Sir Tori Kamirali that very morning, and I remember what he said. He said, well, Chaudhary, what a great shock. Muslims have been abandoned. That was the feeling of every Muslim whether in India or outside. And even Sir Winston Churchill recognized, to quote his own phrase, that his, his Majesty's Muslim subjects have been left helpless to the mercy of Hindus. But that was not to be so. Muslims knew that they were prepared for everything. And if they had a leader like Kaidazam, they were not to fear anything. This strong determination found fulfillment. And at the end, the Muslim League demand had to be conceded. And on the 14th August, 1947, Pakistan came to be established in the map of the world. How could this be achieved? Because many did not realize that it would be achieved. Only few, like Raja Gopalachari amongst Hindus, and as I recall, a British literator, Beverly Nichols, realized that Pakistan will one day come out of the cloud and take its position in the realities of the world. It was he who said, when he met Kaid Azam, that he was meeting the most important man in Asia. Now, you will like to know why and how Kaidazam succeeded. I would like to say, ladies and gentlemen, and it is necessary for us to realize at this critical juncture why Kaidazam succeeded. He succeeded because he wanted nothing for himself. Looked at from that point of view, he was under nobody's jurisdiction. If a person doesn't want anything for himself, he hasn't to care for anybody. He did not care either for fame or for frown. He declared he wanted discipline. He wanted unity. And he would not give up it at any cost. His whole life was dedicated to work. He had no time to spare, to please anybody. He did not like indiscipline anywhere, at any time. 
why Kaide Asam could make a crowd a nation? Because he was master of his own will. He was servile to none. What was his armor? With, he fought, with which he fought the British, with which he fought the Congress. I should like to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, simple truth. That was his armor. With that in both his hands and with his conscience clear and as is known throughout the world, his unimpeachable character, he achieved the great victory which awaited him. When I speak of his unimpeachable character, it reminds me of one little anecdote. You are aware that there, there, that Ananda Bazar Patrika waged a relentless war on Muslim League. But editor of Ananda Bazar Patrika comes from Tangail and uh, not very distant from, uh, his village was not very far from my own village and two families were close friends. We, when uh, I'm, I was a student in Calcutta, we used to meet uh, quite frequently. And one day Mr. Shatindranath Mazumdar was telling me, Do you know, your Jinnah is so arrogant. Even if we give the throne of the Emperor of India, he would not give up his demand for Pakistan. I cannot conceive of a greater tribute being paid to any man by the editor of Arambabasar Patrika. I requested him to write an editorial next day with the caption, Arrogance of Jinnah, and then to say, that he would not give up his demand for Pakistan even if offered the throne of the Emperor of India, even if he's made the Emperor of India. Mr. Mazumdar burst into a laughter. He knew he could not do that. But even, you see, his, re his enemies realized what an unimpeachable character he had. And today, at this critical juncture of our national history, we must once again recall with pride, glory and reverence that the founder of the nation was a person who was not to be shaken in his determination, in his courage, in his fortitude, forbearance, and maintain at all events and at all costs what was known to be a character of Jinnah's soul. You have just heard a talk on the ideology of Pakistan by Mr. Justice Abu Saeed Chaudhry, Vice-Chancellor, University of Dhaka. In our fortnightly series, Qaidi Azam Memorial Lectures. And now here is the question-answer session. What was the method of politics that he followed? And in what way did he differ from the Indian political leaders in his method of politics? By method of politics, sir, I would say that that it might be both educational or constitutional. So, so uh, do you think that he uh, followed uh, both the methods or uh, simply const uh, constitutional or educational? Thank you.
Okay. I am very grateful to you, Mr. Ali, for having put this question. I should have myself told you that his parting of ways with Gandhi was due to this difference in method. In 1921, when Gandhi called for non-cooperation and, and boycotting of the educational institution, Kaide Azam called it unconstitutional and he said that he was not going for this unconstitutional methods for achievement of independence. Throughout his life, he devoted himself to constitutional agitation. He never favored any unconstitutional, disorderly, chaotic action. Constitutionalism is one thing which was in the very blood of Mr. Chenna. And all his agitation was constitutional. And in 1921, he found in the unconstitutional agitation launched by the Congress a move to thwart the progress that the Muslims of India was having educationally, economically, and also politically. And that is why he left the Congress forever. The creation of Pakistan is to me, uh, this is my personal uh, conception, that it is uh, to some extent business or to theological basis. And the division of India is nothing but on the basis of theology and the division of uh, Bengal and the division of Punjab is nothing but or just on the basis of the religion which has been kept aside long back in 16th century by political scientist Machiavelli. So I want your comment. Kaide Asam realized, as all of us did, that the Muslims of India inhabiting different provinces and different regions had a common heritage and culture was the product of a common civilization and therefore he thought along with the nation that there should be a homeland for those who adhered to that common heritage, culture, civilization, and religion, and they were called Muslims. That was the reason for which he wanted the establishment of a separate homeland, for it was found by him in his early years of politics that this community which was minority in India, was not getting a fair deal from the majority. And therefore, in a, in a democracy, this population, having a common heritage and culture, will always be subjected to the domination of Hindus who constituted majority. The basis for partition was a different heritage, culture, civilization, and religion was also a strong factor in the concentration. In our series of talks, Kaidya's memorial lectures, you've just heard a question-answer session which followed the talk on the ideology of Pakistan by Mr. Justice Abu Saeed Chaudhry, Vice-Chancellor, University of Dhaka. With that, Radio...